All right, everybody. So really exciting. We have uh, Dr. Richard Cunningham, MD, actually the ACL doc uh, on the call today with us. So we're going to be interviewing him a little bit about some of his background and some of the some information regarding ACL surgeries in particular. So Dr. Cunningham, you've been all over the country receiving medical training from Amherst College to University of Washington, Salt Lake City, Utah, and then the fellowship in Pittsburgh. So can you tell us a little bit about some of your background and then some of the things that have separated you from the pack as far as ACL specialists? Sure. No, I, um, I, I'm, I was very happy to train at numerous locations and certainly happy that I landed here in Colorado. You know, I'm, I've been here now almost 20 years. I can't believe it. And, and love, love Colorado, especially where we, where we live and work. Uh, but uh, no, I, I went to medical school at the University of Washington in Seattle. And then I did a residency, as you mentioned, at, at the University of Utah, uh, which was great. I was there for five years and then an additional year of sports medicine, which is basically in orthopedics. It's <clears throat> for those that don't know, it's basically arthroscopy of the knee and shoulder. And I did that at, at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, which very strong sports medicine fellowship and uh, was fortunate enough to work with, you know, the the Pittsburgh Steelers when I was there, the Pittsburgh Penguins, and, uh, you know, a lot of great surgeons and um, in, in medical team that you're exposed to, you know, the University of Pittsburgh Athletics and things like that. So uh, that was great. And then, um, again, have been here in Colorado ever since. So very cool. And what things specifically drove you to the knee and shoulder as an area of interest and specialization for you? So I know that I looked at some of your background information. You've had some of these orthopedic surgeries yourself, right? Yes. And one of the other things I kind of wanted to touch on was we've seen a huge progression, not only in the percentage of return to play, but also the time to return to play in a lot of athletes receiving ACL, whether that be repair or reconstruction surgery. So uh, let's maybe talk about some of your experiences personally having these kind of surgeries sure. and then how have these things developed over time and, and you highlighted some of the differences in some of your videos about the, how these surgeries used to be performed versus how they are now. Right. Just growing up, uh, I grew up in upstate New York, actually, and uh, played a lot of sports. I won't say that I was the best at anything, but enjoyed, enjoyed playing sports and had my share of injuries. And, uh, you know, a lot of my uncles who I looked up to were primary care docs. They were family docs in upstate New York and living in smaller towns and taking care of a community. My Dr. John he, Cunningham, he was up in, uh, in Warrensburg, New York, this small town. And uh, I used to stay with him before I'd go skiing and, at Gore Mountain in upstate New York. But in any case, um, you know, I, when I was 17 playing soccer, I, I didn't, I avulsed my ACL actually. So I pulled oh, wow. the ACL up with a chunk of bone, which at that age, if, if you're gonna choose is, is probably the better injury to have rather than a full ACL tear. But that threw me into the orthopedic world. And, and it was funny, I, I really um, identified very much with my orthopedic surgeon in my hometown of Troy, New York. And uh, he was a great guy and um, inspired me, I would say. And then as things evolved, I was actually an English major in college, but you know, had always an interest in orthopedics and, and how do you get there? And, uh, and then also family medicine. I, I thought about that going through medical school as well, but orthopedics really appealed to me, uh, particularly managing sports injuries, uh, just because as you know, there's, there's a lot of lifestyle disease in our country. And uh, I think if we all make better choices in, in our lifestyles, we can avoid some of the, you know, high blood pressure and high cholesterol and cardiac disease and, and, and maybe pulmonary disease and those that smoke and things like that. And orthopedics, um, I just going through my rotations really identified with uh, those patients that just, you know, were, were active and trying to um, resume their sport and wanting to get back to all those things. So really gravitated toward that field in, in medical school. And then again, the orthopedic surgeons that I met along the way, they were kind of, you know, in a way, guys like me, you know, just uh, there's funny things they say in medical school. And, and again, they're like, um, if you, if you can bench press your weight, your weight, uh, you, you're going to go into orthopedics, which I never could do, by the way, but uh, somehow ended up there anyways. 
So, you know, because orthopedists in, in medical school, it's kind of like the, the the jocks guys, you know, that used to play college sports or something, got hurt, and now they're in orthopedics. There's some truth to that, but I really enjoyed all those guys. So, and then with their, and within orthopedics it, itself, as you know, you know, there's foot and ankle, there's hand, there's spine, there's hip, there's joint replacement. Um, there's so many different fields, but <clears throat> I just, I really love arthroscopy and, and fixing things through minimally invasive techniques and getting people back after knee and shoulder injuries to, to all their activities. So that's what kind of led me down that road. Awesome. I was doing some reading last night. It was, it was pretty funny after looking at your really great blogs and I'll, I'll provide in the show notes some of the things like uh, links to your blogs and websites and some of the things that you talk about, especially with uh, concerns to graft locations and utilizing the quad tendon graft and things like that. I was doing some reading and I saw a paper titled The Quad Tendon, The Graft of the Future. But you've been doing this for well over a decade utilizing the quad, the quad tendon and also kind of pioneering the ACL repair surgery as well. So can we just touch on, uh, I don't wanna go like fully in depth, but maybe yeah. touch on graft locations and different things associated with each one, maybe the reconstruction versus repair as well, which you have an excellent post on. Uh, so I'll sure. lead people there, but let's maybe touch on that a little bit right now. Yeah, you know, I think graph location is so critical. And uh, <clears throat> honestly, when I came out of my fellowship in 03, like I worked with guys, uh, some of these names, I'm sure people won't know, but in orthopedics, they're pretty big names. Like Freddie Fu is our chairman and orthopedics at Pittsburgh and uh, Chris Horner. Um, and Jim Bradley, the Steelers doc, and, and guys like that. And, and we were doing what's called transtibial ACL reconstruction at the time. And really what that means is, is we're drilling sockets in the bone. And with the transtibial technique, you're drilling a socket up through the tibia bone. And through that socket, you determine where you place the socket on the femoral side. Well, you know, Freddie Fu actually was one of the, he, he actually published some very well-received and well-regarded papers really starting in 03 to 05 during that time frame where it kind of questioned this whole transtibial technique. And he, moreover, he really started to, to look at the ACL once again and, and show that it really was a double bundle structure. It was like two ligaments in one. Mm -hmm. And so from that kind of came out this whole anatomic ACL reconstruction technique where we're really trying to reproduce what's called the footprint. So where the ACL once, to, once attached in the knee, and at that time, <clears throat> he started to do double bundle ACL reconstruction, and I would keep in touch with him, and I'd um, get back to Pittsburgh and, and learn some of, some of his newer tricks, and I started to do double bundle as well for a period of time. But, you know, since I don't, I really don't do double bundle, but out of that grew this whole anatomic ACL technique where we're placing placing grass exactly where they once lived in the knee, which, you know, when you hear it, you, you think, oh, that makes perfect sense. You know, probably these guys were doing it all along, but we really weren't, believe it or not. <clears throat> Excuse me. We we're using these guides and placing the ACL through this transtibial tunnel technique, which was not anatomic. It, it wouldn't, the graph would not be exactly where it once lived in your knee. <clears throat> and as a result of that, honestly, people weren't as stable. They retore the graphs at a higher rate. Uh, and they just didn't do as well. And, and so since doing these more anatomic ACL reconstructions, that's evolved over time. So it kind of came out of this double bundle technique to then anatomic single bundle. And um, <clears throat> about 10 years ago, uh, there's a colleague of mine down at uh, Emory in, in Atlanta who was doing, starting to do quite a few quad tendon graphs and that really intrigued me. And uh, he made a very good argument as to why that was uh, reasonable to consider, namely that you know, quad tendon is it's about, you know, the other options would be patellar tendon graft or hamstring grafts. And I had been doing hamstring grafts for many years and they work well, but a quad tendon graft is one big section of tendon. It's much more collagen than a patellar tendon graft, for instance. And a hamstring graft, you can have the same amount of collagen, but it's four or five individual strands of tendon woven together as one, whereas the quad is just one big piece of tendon. And um, that all, you know, intrigued me. And I thought it was the, the results, the early results particularly out of this surgeon in, in Emory, but also this surgeon in Mississippi who had been doing it for years were very encouraging. And so um, after uh, going down, spending some time with those docs, I, I started to do this here in Colorado. And um, I think I was the first in Colorado, if that makes any difference, but but it, it certainly has been a great technique and, and I've st stuck with it to this day. You know, as, as time marches on, and that's what is great about what you and I do, Nick, is that, you know, like techniques are always changing and it's a great way to continue learning. And the implants we use today are different than the implants we used 10 years ago. They're smaller and stronger and 
again, all these things can be less invasive. So it's been a journey when I look back on how things started almost 20 years ago to, to today. And I think it's going to be different 10 years from now. That's, that's what makes this so exciting, I think. You know, one thing that I find particularly interesting that I, I really hadn't even heard of in my brief perusing of the literature was the, the repair surgery. And so if, it, if it's torn in a certain location, then you can just tack that right back down to the femur as opposed to going in, taking out the whole thing and then completely replacing it. And that seems really interesting, especially with the recovery time literally cut in half. Right, um, absolutely. Yeah, that's really exciting. And I think uh, I've now done re ACL repairs, primary repairs in certain types of tears. And what they're called is they're called type one tears or proximal tears. So where, where people literally are pulling the ligament directly off the bone or it's very close to its attachment on the femur, we can take that ACL and save it and just reattach it. And, that, and it's, again, if you look back at like surgeons were doing ACL repairs in the 70s and their early 80s, and they failed miserably. And the reason was a number of things. First of all, the, um, peop the surgeons were repairing all types of tears. So even if you tore your ACL right in the middle of the ligament, oh, yeah. they were trying to stitch, stitch that ligament together. And then remember back then there was not arthroscopy. So there'd be a big six, six inch opening of your knee joint. And then um, the suture would be used to try to sew ligaments together in their mid portion, which didn't work. And then the rehab was terrible back then. I mean, you know, you help people with accelerated rehab. And, and back then it was like put people in a cast for eight or 10 weeks and they got a very stiff knee. So it was written off years ago as, okay, this does not work, which for those indications does not work. A mid substance tear, it, repairing it as of today does not work. Um, but uh, again, there was a, a surgeon in, in New York and actually another in, in, in Europe that started to look at this again and say, hey, you know, now we can do it arthroscopically. All our, our sutures are much stronger and we have these anchor suture anchors now, which we didn't have back then. And, and what if we only did it for these tears that like peel off the bone? And, uh, and that again, really intrigued me. I thought, gosh, that's, that's something we should revisit. And like so many things in medicine, I think if you, I don't know what the term is, but if you stick your head in the sand and, and say, okay, that didn't work, it's never going to work again. I think as technology evolves, we have to revisit all these things and say, you know, based on what we know today, can, can should we look at this again? And and I think it's a, it's a great option for it, particularly for kids. I mean, you know, like someone, a kid that's 10 or 12, that's torn their ACL, the risk of that surgery is very high because we're oftentimes, you know, they have open growth plates. So if we're drilling across growth plates, we could uh, cause a growth disturbance. We could cause them to, to have that leg not grow as long or grow uh, with angular deformity. And so if we can repair an ACL, particularly in a kid and not risk any injury to their growth plate, it's a real win. And so in that that patient definitely, but even in adults, I mean, you know, if, if um, I had, you know, actually ACL repairs, I think one the last two weeks, which is a bit of a run for me, because they're not that common. I tell people they're like one in 50 ACL tears. They're not that common, but you have to look for them. And um, if you're a candidate, I think it's a great option. People do really well. And as you said, the recovery is about half as long. You save your normal anatomy. You know, if you ever tore that ACL down the road, like five years from now skiing, then it probably would be a, a normal reconstruction, but it's almost as if you've never had surgery on that ACL before. So it really is uh, exciting and a great option for um, certain types of tears and certain patients. Awesome. Yeah. I actually have a little bit of insight into, I heard about you through actually my roommate who tore his ACL and then, so he lives here in Frisco. And he actually got really lucky because he just searched for like the nearest orthopedic surgeon for like a knee. And then he just walked over to your Frisco location and he happened to get one of the best ACL surgeons in the world. So he's been really lucky in that he got you and his recovery has been going very, very well. So what are some of the things, uh, let's say somebody can't come in to see you up here in Summit County. What are the things people should be looking for as far as an ACL doc to perform uh, the surgery. So you obviously have uh, an orthopedic residency under your belt, as well as a fellowship in a very, very uh, high-end location. So what things could people be looking for? 
Absolutely. Yeah, I think for sure, you know, you, you certainly want an orthopedic surgeon that, that has done a fellowship in sports medicine. And that's, again, arthroscopy of the knee and shoulder, because that within that fellowship, you know, you're not doing hand surgery, foot surgery, spine surgery, you're really concentrating on these sorts of injuries. And in that year, I tell people a fellowship is almost some, some docs liken it to 10 years of experience in practice. You know, for a year, you're really concentrating on just this one field. And uh, so I think ha someone having had a fellowship in sports medicine is, is important. And then certainly when you talk to the doc, I think, I think patients of course wanna feel like they're gonna be well looked after and taken care of and that the doc cares about their outcome. I think a reasonable question would be, you know, to a doc is, you know, um, um, how many do you do a year? I think that's reasonable. And, and I think, um, the, believe it or not, about 80% of ACLs done in this country are done by docs that do 20 or less per year. And so not to say that the, some of those docs can't do a good job, but the studies would show us that you really need to be doing about 50 of a given surgery per year to have good results. So I, I would try to look for a doc that does at least 50 ACLs a year, 50 ACL reconstructions a year. And then other questions to ask or be concerned about is, you know, what graft do you use? And, you know, you can get a very good outcome with a patellar tendon graft or a hamstring graft. Um, I think quads are, are have some slight advantages, so I, I vote for that one. But any of those three gaps would, would, would be a good option. However, I wouldn't recommend <clears throat> donor tendon ACLs, particularly in an active patient and a young patient. If someone's, you know, in their 50s and above, maybe a donor tendon can work fine. I, I do think that's the case. But unfortunately, you know, still in this country, 20-year-olds are getting donor tendon ACL reconstructions. And we know in that category in particular that they tear them at a much higher rate, like up to 30% retear rates, which, you know, we don't want to ever have to put people through this a second time if we can avoid it. So I think those are some of the things I looked for in a doc, though. Awesome. I think, I think that's going to be really great information for people that are, you know, anxious or kind of scared about uh, things and they don't really know what to look for because a lot of people, you know, see all docs is the same and like everybody can do the same things, but there really is a significant difference between people who specialize in certain things and then get those, you know, higher accreditations and higher training levels and things as well. So could you just ballpark for us, maybe just how many ACL surgeries you've done over your career? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely, it's probably up around 2000 or so, I would say something like that, you know, um, just probably above over 2000. I haven't actually, I got to sit down and think about that one, but I'm sure it's over about 2000 or so. Well, that, that's, that's pretty awesome. So you definitely got a decent amount of experience as far as going into the knee. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and it's, you know, it's funny as you know, you're young in your career, for me, as, as I as I get on, it's nice to really focus down on, on a couple things. And, and really, I just do ACLs, meniscus surgery, rotator cuff repairs, and instability surgery of the shoulder, those four things comprise about 80 or 90% of what I do. And I'm okay with that. I think when I first started out, I, you know, and it was okay, you were trained in everything. So you could do a lot of different things yeah. well. But as time marches on, you know, I think you realize, hey, you can't be the best at everything. You better concentrate if you're going to really be a benefit to patients and where I live and work to, to be able to do that. So, yeah. And I, you know, I'm not a big fan of like the 10,000 hours rule because I think there are some things wrong with it. But I mean, I think that you've, you've literally spent 10,000 hours inside of someone's knee, which I think is absolutely an, absolutely an incredible thing. Uh, let's maybe uh, change directions here and talk a little bit about um, something that I do a little bit more, which is trying to prevent ACL surgeries right. uh, in individuals. So especially youth athletes have been trying to go around and do things like incorporating stuff like the, uh, the FIFA 11 plus protocol, kind of taking some of that stuff and put out some information for individuals regarding things they can do for skiing that could potentially decrease their chances of an ACL injury, especially someone who isn't super active or something and just wants to go out on the hill for their vacation. So what are your thoughts and opinions on the current protocols and maybe where they could go in the future as well? Yeah, no, I, Nick, Nick, I think that's great, especially, you know, you spearheading that in Colorado, I think an adaption of the FIFA 11 plus program would be great. And, and for those patients or people out there that maybe don't know, it's, you know, the, the governing body of professional soccer came out with these recommendations on a 20 minute or so warm up program that, that their athletes, professional soccer players, footballers do every time before they train or play. 
and um, and starting to get that information disseminated down to youth athletes uh, around the world that play soccer, because that is like skiing, that, that has a high incidence of associated knee injuries, particularly in our female athletes. And I, I think it's a great thing. You know, it doesn't require any equipment and these young athletes can do it. Um, so, and I think you're absolutely right. The, some of the very same predisposing factors to having a knee injury with uh, soccer are there for our, our young skiers, again, particularly in our young female athletes. Uh, so I think, you know, you um, leading that charge and getting our youth like um, Team Summit, Team Breck athletes uh, and others on this program, that would be great. Yeah, and luckily, I, I, still, I spoke with one of the Team Breck coaches last week in a kind of similar format to what we're doing now. And they seem to already be incorporating a lot of those strengthening things already. So I think that they're totally on board and we've been kind of chatting with them and as far as different things to, to do with those things. So pretty yeah, one thing I find, you know, I, I, one thing I will say that I see that unfortunately, I'm, again, like all of us coaches can't know maybe the latest and greatest preventative exercises, but in our youth athletes, I see a lot of quad strengthening exercises which which are important, but the things we do, you know, the the skiing, um, the soccer, the running, the biking, the hiking, it's very uh, we we tend to get very strong in our quads and our hip flexors, but we get relatively weaker in our hamstrings and our glutes. Yeah. So if anything, I think our young athletes, if they can focus on really strengthening that posterior chain, like the hamstrings and the glutes more than anything in their core, um, you know, instead of going to the gym and, and busting out more lunges and squats and things like that, which they're usually already strong in those muscle groups and they, they tend, tend to ignore the posterior chain, I would say. Yeah, that Nordic hamstring exercise is really gonna be uh, a big one. And biomechanically, the, the hamstring can actually work almost like an accessory ACL, right? Exactly. You know, it, it does provide some stability to the knee because it, it's it, it's causing that posterior direct directed force. You know, yeah. Whereas, believe it or not, when your quads are fire are, are strong, you know, there is there is some anterior tibial translation. It's pulling the tibia forward. Not to say I think you should you need to have all these muscle groups strong, but uh, more more often with weak glutes and weak weak hip uh, muscles, we tend to get that valgus or knock knee alignment, and that puts our knee at risk. Um, if our core is weak, we tend to land in the back seat and, you know, that those back seated landings on a snowboard or whatever it might be, puts your ACL at risk. And, uh, you know, we've done studies looking at World Cup skiers, you know, um, with, one of, with one of the docs of the U.S. ski team, and we look at studies of how they tear their ACLs. And it's usually, you know, let's say coming around a gate, being in the back seat, putting your, your, your downhill ski out to brace the snow and land it with a knee extended with your knee straight. And that puts your, that's, that mechanism is the one in which we see pro skiers tear their ACL the most. And, and I think it's true of, uh, you know, our team summit, team Breck athletes as well. Yeah, I think, I think I may have cited one of those studies in, in kind of creating that sort of blog post that I wrote on the topic. So really glad that you kind of had a bit of a part in the creation of that. That's, that's really cool. Uh, do you have a, I know that you have some other stuff that you've got to go and do pretty soon. So do you have any final words or sage advice for anyone, uh, whether it's uh, looking for an ACL uh, doc or potentially undergoing surgery or anyone that may want to try and prevent this surgery from ever having happened, having needed to take place? Yeah. Yeah. And I would say, you know, skiing in particular, um, just having a big lever arm attached to our foot um, has a high risk of, of knee injuries, uh, ACLs and MCLs and even tibial plateau fractures, other things. So I think some of those things that we discussed, you know, just going into the season strong, strong in your core, strong glutes, strong hamstrings, rolling out the IT band, you know, seeing professionals like yourself to, to get some guidance there, I think is, is important. And then you know, we, you know, you hear it in the office all the time of how did you hurt yourself? And, and you usually, again, as we know, it's, it's a variety of things. It's, you know, the flat light, it's, it's a, you know, I was, I had a flat landing off my uh, snowboard. Um, I landed in the back seat, you know, felt that pop. Um, so uh, I think, you know, be careful of the conditions out there when it's flat light, I would say, you know, maybe shorten your day when you're fatigued, shorten your day. Um, and, uh, 
collisions, unfortunately, we're seeing more and more people get hurt with collisions. And I think on those really crowded days, it, it may be worth to just pull the plug and, and get out of there, honestly. Uh, and then I think as you, you know, looking for a doc, if, if you've hurt your knee, um, you know, someone that, that I think has been in practice for, for a while, you know, maybe at least a, at least a couple years, I would say someone that, that is uh, done that extra training and a fellowship in sports medicine, um, deal with athletes. And it's not unreasonable to ask your doc, you know, Hey, how do you do these? How many do you do a year? Um, uh, what type of graphs do you use? I think going in with some knowledge, uh, is, is important. And, um, I think those are the highlights. Awesome. So we'll be sure to point people in the direction of your blog and very insightful videos on the topic. Thank you so much, Dr. Cunningham, for talking with me today. And hopefully this information goes out to a lot of people and helps a lot of people. Absolutely. Thanks, Nick. And thanks for taking great care of patients in Summit County. And uh, yeah, look forward to sharing, working with more patients in the future. Awesome. Yeah, same to you. I, I know you've been a part of the county for a lot of years and have been bringing great information and work to a lot of the people here. So. Perfect. All right. All right.